The following story is also available as a read-only version. Check the link in the description if you're interested. Walking the ring wall that encircled his city, the vizier wished he could be up on the hill instead, sitting comfortably on the balcony of his mansion, drinking tea. The waves of the stormy sea hammered against the wall below, where they'd been eating into the fused stone for a thousand years. The vizier adjusted his head wrap as a particularly strong gust of wind threatened to take it away. The guard captain, an enormous woman clad in yellow steel glass plate, looked at him with concern. Though many years old, the ritual scars on her face were still red as fresh blood. Is his excellency quite well? she inquired. It's quite all right, the vizier responded. It was important not to appear squeamish in front of the soldiers, and he was doing his best to hide the fear reverberating through him like a gong. Even from the hill, where he could see past the ring wall, days like these could drive shivers down his spine. This is the spot, your excellency. The guard captain gestured to a rounded platform protruding from the wall outward over the sea. It was barely large enough for a single man to stand on, and lacked any kind of parapet. A lone guardsman with a golden halberd stood in defiance of the storm next to it. The vizier was apprehensive about approaching the platform. There were many of them along the ring wall. Hoops of Eversteel were attached to the sides of its openings, allowing daring guardsmen to rappel down. Yet, in spite of its ordinariness, the son of the Politarch had chosen to jump into the sea from this spot. He hadn't done it from a spot that was easier to reach from the palace, and he hadn't chosen to do it from one that was furthest away either. Of course, the palace was at the centre of the city, on top of the hill, but not all roads were made equal, and not all were as convenient. The Politarch had suggested that she was somehow to blame, but in relation to her abode, this platform was as meaningless as any other. The vizier looked down into the city, seeing one of the three ports. In this weather, the water lock was closed, and the many hundred ships in the lagoon were safe from the storm. The singing frigates of the sunwalkers and the bone caravels of the bloodless folk were moored side by side among the plethora of ships, respecting the neutrality of the city. Where is the closest stairwell? the vizier asked. Not far from here, your excellency, only a few minutes of walking. Take me there, he commanded. Of course, your excellency. The guard captain bowed. The vizier stayed as far away from the hole in the parapet as was unshameful. He noted that no other platforms appeared between this one and the stairwell, giving credence to the notion that the prince had ascended here. It led down to a small, snaking island dense with squat buildings hugging the side of the ring wall. Your Excellency, the district at the foot of this stairwell is quite disreputable, the guard captain warned. That's why I have you. He made sure to give the woman a magnanimous smile. In truth, he would have waded into a sewer if it had meant getting off the ring wall. Ten soldiers in full armor could have run past each other on the stairwell, but the vizier still found himself keeping to the ring wall. Every time one of the guards confidently set foot on another step right by the edge, where one slip could lead to a fall many heartbeats long, his throat tightened. When they arrived at the foot of the stairwell, the vizier's legs had begun hurting. Usually, he travelled around the city by rickshaw, and spent most of his time at home or in the palace. He'd become an old man, it seemed. His bones were cold and rickety, and his back fraught with pain. The island at the foot of the stairwell was indeed a cesspit of filth. The coral bricks were porous and worn. The few roofs that were not thatched with palm leaves but wooden shingles were all in dire need of repair. The locals, all dressed in rags, stood still on the poorly paved roads, backing away into home entrances and whispering behind drawn curtains. It occurred to him that none of them had ever seen a vizier before. 
All of them averted their eyes when he looked at them, whether out of fear or shame he could not tell. Only a man with silvery skin and cat eyes met his gaze. He gave the vizier an apologetic smile, then disappeared into a small crowd of bystanders. Almost by the shore near the waterlock, a building towered over the others. It was hardly pristine, but better maintained than the shack surrounded. The smell of strong beer and sour wine mixed with urine and vomit. The innkeep, a fat man with arms like logs and shoulders like construction cranes, was throwing out early troublemakers with a whipping rod. Obscenities the likes of which the vizier had never even imagined possible flew out of his mouth as his wooden sandals clacked on the cobblestone. When the innkeep turned around and saw the vizier, he at first didn't seem to register what he was looking at. Then, like a hinge, he collapsed and began kissing the dirty ground before the vizier's feet, mumbling apologies. The vizier knelt to put a gentle hand on the man's shoulder, prompting him to rise. You've nothing to apologize for, my good man. Rowdy patrons require rowdy methods. Yes, Excellency, whatever you want. The innkeeper nodded profusely, tears of gratitude in his eyes. The vizier was not sure what the man had expected. It was not a crime to curse while in the presence of a vizier. I'd like to inspect this establishment more closely, the vizier told the guard captain. The woman frowned but ordered two of her soldiers to go ahead and secure the interior. The vizier followed them, the innkeeper close to his tail before being held back a few paces by the guard captain. The tavern was completely silent. Even the mechanical music box jingling away in the corner hit a silence between songs. There weren't many patrons at this early hour, but all of them looked at him with frozen emotions ranging from surprise to fear. A group of bloodless folk, pale, huge and hairless, were the first to resume their carousing. Others followed, careful to keep the vizier in sight. The cat-eyed man from earlier was sitting alone at a table in the back corner of the room. The vizier wondered how he had gotten here so quickly. He was nursing a steaming mug of what smelled like mulled beer. Much to the guard captain's frustration, the vizier approached the cat-eyed man without letting one of her underlings frisk him first, and took a seat on the creaking chair opposite to him. You know why I'm here. It was a statement of fact, not a question. I know many things, your excellency. That is one of them. Despite his friendly appearance, the cat-eyed man's voice was dark and raspy. His accent was refined, like a scholar's might be, and it didn't fit the surroundings at all. The Politarch's son, he was here last night, wasn't he? The vizier asked. And not for the first time, your excellency. He was a regular, even had a set of commoner's clothes so he could walk the streets safely without an escort. The vizier nodded. The prince had made a habit of shaking his tails whenever he left the palace. Because he always returned, the politarch had soon stopped worrying. Was there a reason for his continued patronage? Certainly not the beer. The cat-eyed man grimaced as he took a swig. Either his manners needed work, or he didn't care about disrespecting the vizier. He had, shall we say, a pearl up in the gallery he was quite taken with. The vizier looked up, finding a white selection of nubile young girls timidly peering over the railings. Did something occur? Months ago. She was killed by disease. A shame, too. She was such a pretty young thing. Like a princess from a distant land. The cat-eyed man tilted his head. The prince continued to come after she passed, to drown his sorrows. The vizier leaned back in his chair, sadness spreading through his chest from the realization of what had taken place. Young love could be fierce. Too fierce for some. No, that's not what happened. The cat-eyed man spoke as though he could read the vizier's thoughts. Before he could inquire further, the fat innkeep appeared, holding out a lavishly filigreed bottle of walnut liqueur from the Moonrock Isles. It looked to be as valuable as the rest of his inventory combined. Here, on the house, Excellency, he insisted. The vizier shook his head, smiling. 
You owe me neither an apology nor gratitude. I am not in need of drink. Lock that bottle up where it belongs. The innkeeper bowed, then stomped off back to his counter. That man worships everyone who lives on the hill like they are living gods. To think he never knew whom he was serving breaks my heart, the cat-eyed man said. What did you mean earlier? the vizier demanded. It has been said that, for a month or so, the prince has been hearing the call of the sea. That is a euphemism for suicidal ideation, the vizier noted. He was beginning to lose patience. I assure you it is quite real, your excellency. Difficult to describe to someone who hasn't experienced it. Like a mother's embrace and a seductive moan at the same time. Only felt in the heart, not heard. The cat-eyed man's eyes trailed off into the distance for a moment. So you have experienced it? I am experiencing it right now. It's why I live so close to the ring wall. Moving further into the city causes me physical discomfort, the cat-eyed man explained. So why haven't you thrown yourself into the sea? the vizier asked. Because I value living. There are certain substances that can keep her calls at bay, dull them, or even entirely blur them out. The prince was not one for deviating from his usual poisons. The cat-eyed man tapped the side of his mug. Still, that would clean up the reason for his death, the vizier noted. Oh yes, definitely. But it's more than just a tragic chain of events. It's something to be concerned about. The cat-eyed man had a wry smile on his lips. Explain. Hearing the call of the sea runs in the family, as it were and it can do much more than just lure people to their deaths. The cat-eyed man gestured toward the door. The sea has been trying to claw its way into this city of ours since the ring wall was raised. Her methods are insidious, as your guards will be able to attest to. It might be a good idea to keep the Politarch away from the ring wall in the future. Who knows what the sea could convince our appointed protector to do. Drink up and come with me to the palace, the vizier ordered. The cat-eyed man shook his head. No, your excellency. I'd rather die than leave the shadow of the ring wall ever again. I'm not granting you a choice in the matter. Your services are being requisitioned. You will be compensated, but you cannot refuse. I already have. The grin on the cat-eyed man's face was that of an untouchable victor. A droplet of blood came out of his nostril, followed by a light stream. Green foam formed in the corners of his mouth. One by one, his thick black hair went grey, individual strands at first, then whole patches at once. The guard captain grabbed his chair and pushed him further back, putting herself between the cat-eyed man and the vizier. In her grasp, the cat-eyed man keeled over, threw up bloody wretch onto the floorboards and died. As the light left his enigmatic eyes, he still had that victorious grin on his lips. Throw him into the sea, the vizier ordered, and get me a rickshaw for the palace. If you liked this story and would like to hear more, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. A new short story is uploaded every Wednesday and there will occasionally be another one in between if I find the time. Thank you very much for listening and have a great day.